Thanks for listening to the Media People Podcast, the show where we learn about the people who make up the media industry. I'm your host, Victor Genova. For more episodes, go to soundcloud.com slash media people podcast or subscribe on iTunes by searching Media People Podcast. Views expressed by participants are personal. Event manager, promoter, and marketing manager are arguably three of the most sought-after positions in the media world. But today's guest, Jeff Atkinson, wears all three hats. He's the vice president of sales and marketing at Green Savvy Racing Promotions. And while you may not be familiar with the company name, if you're from the Toronto area, you'll probably be familiar with one of their events, the Honda Indy Toronto, an IndyCar race that's been a staple on the North American open-wheel racing calendar since 1986. Along with his aforementioned duties, Jeff also serves as president of the race. Jeff Atkinson chats with us about managing one of Canada's largest annual sporting events and what it's like working in the racing world, a place where he has spent virtually his entire professional career. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Victor, thanks for having me. Jeff, you wear two hats. You are the vice president of sales and marketing for Green Savvy Racing Promotions, but you're also the president of the Honda Indy Toronto. What does this all entail? The everyday responsibility of, of obviously the IndyCar race here in Toronto, which is known as the Honda Indy Toronto. Um, you know, we have a staff here in Toronto of a handful of people. We have staff uh, in Indianapolis, St. Petersburg, and Ohio that also come in for this event. But on a day-to-day basis, the person that has to sit in this chair and be the president of the Honda Indy Toronto, uh, which currently is myself right now, uh, that person is responsible for the marketing sales and the operations of, of the day-to-day with the Honda Indy Toronto. So if you had to wrap everything up into like one word, would you call yourself a promoter then? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I think the, the key thing in our, our business is to make sure we're in the business to promote uh, events. You know, for us, we promote a festival here, which happens to be an IndyCar race, which is our key component. Um, our, our big event on the Sunday is a, uh, a Verizon IndyCar Series race, and our big event on the Saturday is the NASCAR Pinty Series race. So it really ties in the weekend together. Let's talk about how you got to where you were, because you grew up in Woodstock, Ontario. That's about, what, two, two and a half hours outside of Toronto? Yeah, a- absolutely. I, I grew up in, in Woodstock, uh, spent a lot of time in that community. And, you know, I think as a kid growing up, had a had a passion for sports. Uh, that passion was not necessarily motorsports at the time. But, you know, I think through the passion of sports, not being a an athlete or someone that was going to make it uh, physically, um, you know, I think the, the next big thing for me to, was to – to look at university options and schooling and, and see how I could best break into the, the sport field. And that led me to uh, an education at Brock University with the sport management program. And from there, uh, got involved in, uh, in motorsport. And, you know, since I've become uh, involved in motorsport, have fallen in love with it. Uh, I believe it is a, uh, one of the best businesses you can work at if you're a promoter, just because from a commercial standpoint and a marketing standpoint, there are so many opportunities to be creative, whereas other uh, properties and events, you don't have the flexibility that you do have in motorsport. Well, we have a lot of guests who have had multiple roles at multiple different companies, but the one thing I find very interesting is even though you've technically worked at three different companies, it's all been with the Honda Indy within that race. So after university, how did you break into the company? So long, long story short, um, at the time, there was a position open with uh, the, at the time, was a, a champ car race, uh, which uh, was a form of open wheel racing, very similar to what the cars are today. And uh, I, I took a, a position here uh, through a, a friend of mine, and uh, that led to me working on the Toronto, Denver, and Las Vegas races all in the same year. So, you know, my, my first year, a lot of experience uh, just from the commercial standpoint, uh, in my first 365 days as a as a as an employee here, that from there led me into you know I think developing in the motorsport field in the community gets to know a lot of the people a lot of the same faces travel around event to event, uh, and in 2008 uh, Kim uh, Green and Kevin Savory. Uh, purchased uh, the Honda Toronto with the, their partner at the time, Michael Andretti, and from there had an opportunity to come back and and spend some time uh, building the event into what it is today, and that's the Honda Toronto. So you, that was between two different companies at that time. It, it, it was, yeah, absolutely. So uh, at the time in in Canada, it was known as the Grand Prix Association of Toronto, uh, which was a subsidiary of uh, Champ Car, uh, which was the organizing or sanctioning body at the time. Uh, and then uh, in 2008, there was a merger between uh, their rival or competitor uh, in IndyCar. When there was that merger and IndyCar came to town in place of Champ Car, uh, did you have to approach anything differently? Because I'm kind of looking at it like a different circus comes to town, but you've got the same date and everything else about it is pretty stable. So I, I think the big difference 
between 2007 and, and 2009, and I, I think at the time we were faces in Champ Car, is you had a very uh, a product that was essentially the same, but to the consumer it created confusion. So the confusion was immediately eliminated. There was only one premier open wheel racing series in, in North America, and that was uh, at the time the, the Indy Racing League, now known as the, the Verizon Indy Car Series. And you know, for us, it was important to have all the stars and the cars of that series in one in one competitive lineup. So, you know, it, I don't want to say it became easier, but it, it definitely was easier to promote in a sense that the messaging could be these are the stars and cars of the Indianapolis 500. And from there, uh, we can really look at it from a an aspect of starting to grow the event. And I, I think from there, reaching back into time and looking what had worked and, you know, looking at the festival aspect of things, whether it be the Indy Fest or, you know, for us, a, a beer fest component. And, you know, it kind of evolved from 2007 from today, 2015. Talk to me a bit about promoting the race, because something I find fascinating about it is it's one of the biggest sporting events in Ontario, probably in Canada, that happens annually. But unlike stick and ball sports, like we'll say hockey or baseball, you're on the map for three days, and then you disappear for the rest of the year, whereas hockey can come back and go, well, we've got another game in three days. Basketball can say the same thing. Their off-season is a lot smaller than what you have to deal with. So, I mean, after the checkered flag flies and the race is done... How do you stay relevant in the community or in the media for the remaining 11 months leading up to the next race? That, that's a great question. Often, many times I say we don't have 41 home games or 81 in the sense of baseball. We don't have that luxury. So I, I really believe it's important for us to be good communicators to our event goers who attend our event and our fans. Uh, with that, we have a great partner in, in Honda and Sportsnet who I, I think share the same goal of, as, as we do, and that's to grow motorsport in Canada. So we often work with them uh, to make sure they know when the, the other races are being televised and viewed. Uh, Pre-event this year especially, we have been focusing heavily on uh, extending our, our marketing platform. You know, being relevant for us, being a three-day weekend event, typically you focus on the day after the Indianapolis 500 and, and work into uh, the race date, which this year is July 15th to the 17th. This year we're actually extending into February, beginning with a, an auto show exhibit uh, here this uh, this month. Uh, with the Canadian International Auto Show. So that's something we typically haven't done. And if we can extend that into to March and April and May through other, other activations and uh, appearances, I, I think we will definitely become more relevant in the market than we have been in the past. Okay, so I went back and looked at, because uh, this is the 30th time the race has happened. It started in 1986. And I went back and looked at the history books, and it seems like there's been a Canadian in pretty much every race. However, last year there something interesting happened or something something horrible happened that James Hinchcliffe from Oakville, Ontario, uh, suburb of Toronto, uh, he was injured in practice for the Indianapolis 500 and was out for the rest of the season. So I'd say well, it was about six weeks out. And you said uh, in our previous question that Indianapolis is kind of like where you guys kick off. You really get your promotional work in, in high gear. And all of a sudden you do not have a Canadian to promote to the Canadian audience. Did you have to change the way you approached your promotional work last year? Yeah, no, we, we you know, James is a big part of, of the event. Uh, he is a great spokesperson for the sport. Uh, he does a great uh, job speaking for us as well. And, you know, we had to take a look at how we're using them from a marketing standpoint. But I, I think the unique thing about us from a, an advertising standpoint is, you know, when you say the, the term indie, it speaks large event. It, it speaks adrenaline. It, it speaks a lot of uh, different phrases and, and words that we can associate with it. So, you know, we yes, we did have to adjust. But, you know, we're just glad that James is going to be back for 2016. And uh, he's going to be a big part of our marketing for 2016 as well. Speaking of marketing, how have things changed for you since you started with the, uh, I mean, with the first company, when your first gig with the race, we'll say go back to what, 2006, 2007? What sort of things have changed? Is there a certain medium or a certain platform that you put a greater emphasis on for promotional work than you did? seven or eight years ago? The, the marketing landscape has very much changed since 2007. You know, there is absolutely more emphasis being placed on digital. You know, digital is such a, a key platform of what we do. Uh, you think race and you think technology. So a lot of our consumers and subscribers uh, who will ultimately hopefully become event goers are definitely checking out the latest and greatest technologies. So for us, it's been, uh, you know, really uh, taking a look at what technologies are evolving, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google, and so on, uh, in approaching different advertising mediums than 
are not your traditional advertising mediums. That's not to say we abandon TV. We, we don't. It's still a big part of our game as uh, obviously it's important to be on uh, Sportsnet and uh, the other uh, networks out there. But, you know, in terms of some of the digital side of things, we want to make sure we are including them uh, as well as uh, following what's developing. Talk to me a bit about the other races. You mentioned that you don't just look after Toronto. You've got St. Petersburg. There's a race in Ohio. You've also had experience in Denver and Las Vegas. But let's pick on St. Petersburg mm-hmm. right now because you, you work on that simultaneously with Toronto, uh, and that race is coming up. And it's also a street race like Toronto. Uh, your promotional work, is it different in St. Petersburg than it is in Toronto? Or do a lot of things overlap? Do things work? I'm trying to see if there's any sort of cultural differences. Or yeah, great approach. question. We we have a great team in St. Petersburg on the on the day to day, and in terms of just my responsibilities, it, it's just you know being a leader where I can be in terms of the sales and marketing side of things. But the the Toronto market and Ohio market as well, and in St. Petersburg are all vastly three different, vastly different markets. They're all different, and with that, you look at different mediums to advertise and capture your audience you're trying to attract. So we do take a, a look at at what works. What work in, what works in St. Petersburg may not work in Toronto, and what works in Toronto may not work in Ohio. So it's very important to know the demographic that you're speaking to. In between your work with the uh, Toronto race, there was one year where it went on sabbatical during that merger you mentioned earlier in 2008. And during that time, you uh, went over to Tennis Canada. Tell us about your time there. You know, Tennis Canada was a great experience um, for me. I think it was, at that time, very important for me to get out of the, the motorsport culture and experience a different organizational culture, uh, different tactics, different strategies, and so on. And I was very grateful that the time I spent there, and they were very good to me during that time. And I, I learned a lot from the staff that was, that was in place there. Did anything carry over from racing to tennis? Because I would imagine ten, one thing that's really similar about promoting a major tennis match uh, with promoting a race is the fact that uh, they disappear for 11 months as well, just like a race does. Did that carry over by any chance or anything else? Yeah, no, the, there, there are a lot of similarities, especially in the demographics of the, the profile of the consumer. Oh, really? Um, th- there are, okay. um, in my opinion. Uh, and I, I don't really want to get into details of that, but there are very much similarities. But I, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of the big one, and that is it's relevant for, in this case, 10 days. Uh, they have a, an opening weekend and a, and a following weekend that uh, is obviously their championship. And, you know, it was just a great experience overall for me to see a different event uh, unfold and to be a part of that in a big way. Is there anything you learned from tennis that you carried over when you returned back to uh, being a race promoter? I, I think for me, it was really about you know, personal growth as it related to uh, understanding sales in marketing. Um, you know, vastly different budgets, and I, I don't pretend to know what the budgets were there, but um, you know, different different budgets overall and uh, different strategy and different time of the year. You know, our event has always been in July in Toronto. Their event is in August. That's potentially a different consumer, but also could be the same consumer. When you're going to approach a potential sponsor for the race, not necessarily the title sponsor like like Honda, but one of the sub or associate sponsors, how far in advance do you have to pitch to them? Because I imagine with a lot of the banners that have to go up, uh, understanding where they're going to be at the track, if they're going to do an on-site execution, that they need a lot of lead time to do that. Sure. You know, in terms of, you know, acquiring partners and that, it, it takes a long time to cultivate in a lot of instances. There, there's no magic timeline in terms of how long it's going to take, but each each client is different. Each client gets into, for whatever reason, uh, they decide to get into a, a partnership, whether it be with a race or a, a hockey team or a baseball team. But it's really on the the property uh, to uh, understand what that cultivation process is, and it is different with each brand you speak to. Is there a specific execution that you've worked on at the race, say with a partner, or maybe you didn't work on it, but they came on board and they did something that you were really proud of or that you thought was really great that you want to share? I've no. got one that comes to mind. Okay. Here. The, one, one that comes to Go mind is it. you had the Canadian Armed Forces there about three or four years ago, sure. and they brought in a lot of their heavy machinery. And it's the kind of machinery that really gets kids interested, like big trucks, tanks, and things like that. And it literally turned into a giant playground. And I don't think I had seen so many people, so many young people excited about our armed forces or interested in what they were doing than they did at that time. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, no, I, you know, any partner that gets involved in our event, and I really think this is where – you know, our event separates from some of the uh, arena type uh, properties. In here, essentially, you have three days of upwards of eight hours per day at our at our event. You know, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday this year, July fifteenth to the seventeenth. 
you have a lot of inter- interaction time with the event corps that's down at the property. So any sponsor that, that does get involved, whether it be the Armed Forces or Honda or whoever it might be, you know, they have a lot of time to capture the audience. That is to interact with the event corps, whether it be them stepping in a new car or them tasting a new beverage or whatever it might be, you know, they are heavily involved in terms of being able to interact with our consumers. So, you know, for us, it's really about the end product. It's really hard to conceptualize because of that one weekend, as you mentioned earlier, because it's only three days a year. And it's great to see when a event comes together for that, for that, well, this year, July 15th and 17th, and see how the events come together overall and, and each activation takes, takes shape. And with that, you just look back, you know, you look, you look at the event site, you look at the event and say, you know, it's special what all these partners do in, in terms of interacting with the fans and creating this for, for our event core. Is there a lot of camaraderie between yourself and the other promoters, like a lot of knowledge sharing? Because I know you mentioned you look after two other races outside of Toronto, but there's another, what, 14 or 15 races on the schedule. Yeah. Any learnings that you get from your counterparts? Well, Green Savory with the being three races in terms of, uh, you know, our North American presence with St. Petersburg, the Middle House Sports Car Course, and uh, the Honda in Toronto, that's three IndyCar races. You know, we can really learn best practices and efficiencies. And, and I, I think, you know, we look at all – realms of, of promotion, whether it be motorsports or hockey, baseball, basketball, football, whatever it might be, you know, if we can pick up best practices that are being used in the industry, uh, we would absolutely want to investigate what those practices are and, and from there implement them. Jeff, this has been a great talk. I'm going to close with the same question that I do with everyone else. If you weren't in media or marketing or promotions, what would you be doing and why? <laughs> that that is a that is a great question. Hard hard to answer, but you know I think myself. Um, I, you can I, make I, it up if you want to. Well, no, I, I, I don't I don't need to make it up. You know my 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 dad was a teacher. My mom worked in education, and you know I always thought education would be a, a very important thing for me to teach people uh, about maybe some of the skills I have. If I can transfer you know some of those skills to other people. Um, that would probably have been a, a great career choice, I, I think. So whether it be an education uh, teacher at a university or uh, high school or collegiate level, whatever it might be, I, I really think probably education would have been my call. Alternatively, um, believe it or not, I, I have a computer background. So uh, it, the, if, if I came down to a, a focus of what the teacher would be, it would probably would have been in something computer-related. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks for your time, Victor. Thanks for listening to today's show. For more episodes, go to soundcloud.com slash media people podcast or subscribe on iTunes by searching media people podcast. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Vic Genova.